So welcome everyone. My name is Wayne Dean with 3D Sales Training and Sales Pro. Um, this is our second uh, Thursday of the month. We usually are going to do uh, for ACA members um, our sales club, but we also are doing it right now each uh, Thursday of the month until September, and then we'll go to the monthly classes. So on the first, third, and fourth Tuesday, I actually do other sales coaching uh, from 3D Pro Services. But today's session is one of about 50 that I do on different sales topics. Um, range from uh, two weeks ago, we did my step up system of selling. Uh, last week, we did how to deal with difficult people. This week, we're going to be talking about negotiating. And as I start this session on negotiating, um, I want to remind you that there was a recent university of Pennsylvania study that showed that anxiety is the number one emotion felt by salespeople during the negotiation process, when actually a negotiation should be really seen as productive conversations. And first thing I ask is, when you think about yourself, those of you that are watching this live or those of you who are going to watch the video, are you a player? What I mean is, do you love to negotiate? And real players, they enjoy the game and they play to win. But there's a lot of people that just don't really like to play in negotiation. Think about it this way. So let's say you're walking in, you're traveling today and you check into the Marriott and they say the rack rate is $139. Now, do you accept it, which most people do, or can you have the guts to tell them that, hey, I won't pay that rate? Because each hotel has what's called the rack rate. And the rack rate is what they figured actually cost to open up that room, cleaning, whatever. And if that room uh, cost is $71, let's say, to open that room to have it cleaned, anything they sell over that is a, a profit. So some people will actually go ahead and pay, think they got their best deal from Expedia or TripAdvisor, whatever, and they're not willing to negotiate and ask for it, but a player will. A player will ask and will, is comfortable with negotiating. But here's why most of us aren't comfortable with negotiating. It's really our culture. You know, this is what's interesting. The United States is the only country with a Fair Labor Negotiation Act. In, in, we are taught, mama taught us um, to play fair, and uh, we even have laws that require us to play fair where other countries, they negotiate, it is part of the culture. So we sometimes don't want to negotiate, but sometimes we deal with other people that it is more common to them to want to negotiate. But going back to that previous slide, anxiety is what most people feel when it comes to negotiating. And many people, even some senior salespeople, believe that they really don't have any power as the seller because the customer has all the power and they can ask for discounts and we must comply to get the sale. So the objective of today's session is really to understand the buyer, maximize your negotiating moments. I'm gonna give you a couple of tactics, two or three just tips. We're not gonna be able to jam into this a full day of negotiating that I do, but in the next 45 minutes, we'll try and give you a couple of tips. But we need to understand sources of leverage, negotiating leverage. And there's really eight sources of leverage. What you actually believe, we already talked about, did you believe that you're a player? Do you believe that negotiating is a normal activity in the selling process or are you afraid of it? Needs, the, how do, who needs the sale? Who needs to get this deal done? Emotional, are you emotionally involved in the process? Really good negotiators aren't emotionally involved in the process. Time elements, how much time do we have on both sides can be a source of leverage. The relationship that you built between somebody and that person that you're trying to negotiate with. A full understanding of that other person, ownership over this whole process to begin with, and typical if you do have negotiating skills. So these are the sources that create that leverage in negotiating. And one who basically understands each of these and gets better at them is going to be better at negotiating. So again, the outcome is, you know, what is it that you really want to take away from here? You know, think about it this way. The one who cares the most, who needs it the most, does not have leverage. So go for the no, like, hey, should I just stop right now? 
after giving cost into somebody or bracketing, whatever, you have to get them. Sometimes you have to think about it. Who really in this process needs this deal the most? And the person who needs it the most is the one that has less leverage. So sometimes as a salesperson, you've got to have the, the guts and discipline to be able to act as if you don't need this deal that well. I mean, we'll get to it later on my slides, but sometimes people will say to me and negotiate it. Man, Wayne, you, you don't seem, um, you know, any sense of urgency. Don't you want my business? And my response is, would it surprise if I said, yes, I want your business, but I don't need your business. And that really changes that dynamic. So because I, as much as I'd like to work with you and be able to come to an understanding of a deal, um, I don't need your business to keep the lights on. Uh, I'm not desperate to have your business. And you reverse it on them. Say, how do you feel about working with somebody who's desperate? Somebody who has to make this deal to make their car payment or somebody has to make this deal to pay the rent. Um, how do you feel about that? Well, while the buyer might think, well, I really want to work with somebody that's desperate. I think I'll get a better deal. Then you come back and say, yeah, but let, let's, let's pretend that I'm desperate to get your deal. So I discount it. I do whatever I can to get your deal. Now I'm not making as much money on your deal as some other new prospect that comes along. Who do you think I'm going to spend most of the time with? And they're really not thinking necessarily about you, but it's thinking about somebody else that they might be negotiating with and come back and say, yeah, that makes sense. You know, we don't really want to deal with desperate people. So you have to reverse it and show them that being desperate for their deal isn't advantageous to either one of you. So that's where you lose some sources of leverage is if you have to have the deal and be careful about coming across as the how important it is to you that you get that deal. So again, think about it this way. You want their business, but you don't have to have it. Because think about it this way. Negotiating is really modifying your price or terms in some way to get the agreement. That's negotiating. True selling though, is getting your price on your terms and your conditions. So really most negotiating problems are really selling problems because a great negotiator focuses on being a great seller first, thus reducing the amount of negotiating to a minimum. So tip number one, first and foremost thing, before any negotiation, you must firmly establish your walkaway point. Stick to it. But know what your walk away point. And, and a quick little story. I was working with a client who had asked me to help him in negotiating with uh, his boss on a salary. Now, this person worked in the football, in the National Football League, and was really excited about working in, in professional football. And so when he came to me and said, hey, I, I need to ask for a higher raise. I need some more money. I said, well, what's your walk away point? At what point would you not take this job? Uh, what is it? And the, oh God, I, uh, you know, I love it. I, I, I'd work for free if I had to. And I will see now that's the problem. You're already going into negotiating with, you want, well, how much you want? He said, well, I want 150,000. I go, yeah, so you want 150,000, but you'll take anything because you're so excited to work in there. See how you've lost all your leverage. So I said, what's your walk away point? What, what point would you not be able to work for them? And he said, well, I'm not really sure. And I said, well, at what point would your wife tell you <laughs> you have to walk away from this job? We don't have enough money to pay the bills, take the kids to college, what is it? And from there, he created his walk away point. And I think when we go into negotiations, sometimes people are so excited about, we just want to get the deal. Sure, I'd like to get it at this level. I'd like to get it at this volume or this amount, but I'll accept even lower but you don't commit to what your, your walk away point really is that when it's important. So number one, this, before you go into any negotiation, make sure you write down what your walk away point is. And I mean, seriously, write it down somewhere because it's called kinesthetic learning. As soon as you write something down, it goes from your pen up your arm and into your brain and it sticks there because you wrote it down what your walk away point is. So define that, you know, um, salespeople put a, of time and effort into a proposal and they hold on to it longer and they fight hard, fight hard but they didn't know what their walk away point was before so i think i've delivered that belabored that point for you right away tip number two never give without a get never give something 
a concession without getting something in return. It could be as simple as when somebody asks you for, um, hey, can you give me a 10% discount? You know, I'd be happy to give you a 10% discount if you'll do something for me. Be quiet and then let the client call you back and say, well, what do you mean? What, do you, what would you want? Well, I'd be glad to give you a 10% discount, but we need to expedite how much um, down payment up front. Or we need to change the terms from net 30 days um, to net 15. Never give a concession without giving some, get, getting something in return. Because otherwise, as soon as somebody says, well, you know, I'll go with you if you give me 10% discount. Yeah, okay, great. And then that person thinks, oh, maybe I should ask for more. And they don't feel comfortable with the deal. So always feel like it costs a little bit to give something up. So you need to make sure that you follow that rule. Never give without a get. All right. Otherwise, they'll keep ringing you like a wet rag. As long as they can get water out of it, they'll keep ringing it. So gain some concession of value in return. So again, most people are worried about, boy, if I walk, what if I walk away from the table and I'm not really sure if I got the best deal I could for my company, or I, I had to discount too much, or I, I sell too much on price, not the value. You know, those buyers are getting tougher out there and you often end up in lengthy and uncomfortable price negotiations. And that's why most people come to me and ask me about a session on negotiating because these are some some of the challenges that they face. Some other ones are, they really just wanna reduce the discounting that they see that they're doing. And they're getting price pressure because of the gr growing uh, commodity mindset. You know, they think your product is commodity. Now think about a commodity this way. Can I get the same thing somewhere else, the exact same thing somewhere else? Now people always argue with me, so oh, my, price, my product is a commodity. And I go, okay, well, think about it. I saw milk the other day at Costco, two gallons of milk for $6. And then I went to 7-Eleven and they had one gallon of milk for $6. It's same thing, it's milk. So if, if the milk is the cheapest at Costco, why isn't everybody going to Costco to buy their milk? Because maybe it's the convenience of buying only one gallon, uh, maybe it's fresher, whatever the reasons are, it's not truly a commodity in that they can get the exact same thing somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And as far as we talked earlier, one of the mindsets that you have to have is the belief. And the belief that you have to have in negotiating is this, what can't they get somewhere else? I mean, let's say you have a similar product or service, but what can't they get? And what they can't get is you. You are a huge part of the four-legged, as we call it, the tool as far as the stool, as far as what the value proposition is. The value proposition is this. What is the product? What does the product do? What problem does that product solve for the client? And then how would they evaluate that against the competition? So let me repeat that four-legged stool. What's the product? What does the product do? What problem does that product solve for the client? Because people buy solutions to their problem. They don't buy your product or service. And then how would they evaluate that? And you are a huge part of that fourth leg. So when you're thinking about negotiating and somebody starts to say to you, hey, I can get the exact same thing somewhere else, and they start to use that as a source of leverage, you have to have the guts to say to them, yeah, but what can't you get at my competition? Can't get me. And I'm just curious, Mr. Prospect, how important is that? The professionalism, the customer service, the additional service that I might bring you, how valuable is that? And again, it's just sometimes one more reason why that person shouldn't go somewhere because they weren't treating your product or service as a commodity. So think about if other situations. I want to think it, give you a situation. You're just about ready to start the delivery process. You sold a product to a client, but now this is a savvy, this is a player, but the buyer now wants to move up the completion date or the delivery date from previously agreed on. They want to move it up by as much as two months. How do you think you'd respond? Now, a lot of salespeople, they wouldn't want to lose the, the deal. So they said, well, let me do the best. Let me see if I can. And they try and do whatever they can do to accommodate. And I understand that's good customer service. But again, what you need to think about is why is the person asking for that? So you, the response, the answer that I want you to think about from now on, when somebody wants to, you to make concessions afterwards is, hey, that's interesting. 
is there anything that's really preventing us from negotiating that deadline? Turn the tables back on them. You know, we take all this pressure to perform all the time. Put it back on them and say, what's preventing us from negotiating that? Because did they really need to move it up by two months? Or were they asking for two months, hoping you'd settle for one? And so just keep the conversation going. Go back to the third slide we had where I said negotiating is really just a series of a serious conversation with somebody. So continue that conversation with that person instead of immediately giving in to their leverage that they think that they have that they're going to not give you the sale if you don't commit to the two month uh, initial delivery time. And turn it back on. Hey, is there anything that's preventing us from negotiating? They go, well, what do you mean? Well, help me understand specifically why two months of all the time you could pick 60 days. Why 60 days? Suppose, let's pretend I can't do 60 days, but I could do maybe some things to make it 30. How would that solve your problem? Get into that conversation with the person instead of immediately giving a concession to them. Because again, you've become a person who's not uncomfortable with negotiating. You look forward to it and you are a player, not just automatically giving in every time somebody wants to you to uh, give in a concession because they think they have more leverage than you do. So I want you to think about review the problem in the step system that I taught everybody. If you haven't seen it, go back to two weeks ago. I've sent out, and if you haven't, email me again. I'll send you the link to watch the recording on the initial step system that I teach, which is size up the situation. Who is this person? How do they process information? Visual, auditory, kinesthetic. What is their disk profile? How do they take in information and how do they communicate? To Who is this person so that you can communicate to them in the best way that they would receive your information? T is take them to their problem. What is the problem that they specifically have that you are uniquely positioned to solve? E is extend that problem or living with it or solving that problem into the future. What are the consequences of solving that problem? What are the benefits of solving it today? But again, what could be some of the issues if we don't solve this, let's say a year from now? And then P, propose a solution. So just remember this, everyone has a problem. Everyone wants to get rid of the problem. But one of the sources of leverage is this, no one wants to admit that they have a problem as they think that that gives the seller more leverage if they tell them that they have the problem. So you need to spend a lot of time before negotiation comes up, fully understanding the, the pr problem that this person has. What's the challenge or issue that you are uniquely positioned to fix so that you don't always lose your leverage when it comes to negotiating? So remember, everyone has it but now determine the impact the problem has. Let them share it with you. Make it easy for them to agree that they have a problem. But remember of the eight things we were talked about uh, as far as source of leverage, understanding. Understanding what their decision limits are. Typically, we can talk to people who can make a decision to tell you no, but maybe they don't have the ability to tell you yes. They can say no to the product or service, but they can't say yes. And so you, you fully need to understand what the decision limits might be for that person you're negotiating with. And obviously timing is such that, that changes your sources of leverage. Again, sometimes people say, um, hey, the best time to buy a car is the end of the month because the salesperson is trying to hit his quota. He's trying to get his bonus before the end of the month. So they're more willing to negotiate and deal at the end of the month. Well, have that conversation with your customer or client that, you know, maybe they're not in the car industry, but what's timing in their world look like? Could it be as much as they don't have the inventory space? They want to buy your product or service, but now what they're, they don't want to tell you that, hey, if we bought it today, we don't have the warehouse space. So they're willing to try and negotiate and push it out further, even though you might have offered discounts if they buy it now. But the timing isn't right because they bought your product or service today and you did deliver it. They might not have the space. Or what is the timing if you did deliver it now? And maybe you could do something like negotiate. Hey, is that going to hold us back? Is that you're worried about that? How about this? What if we do it in an incremental that you buy a certain lot now and that we deliver 
Then we divert another lot next month, so you don't have to maintain that huge inventory, but you still get the same price. If we were able to offer that, would that be fair? Would that make sense? So fully understand timing on both parties, both yours and theirs. But some of the methods that buyers use to gain leverage are final like this. The knee-jerk reaction, the, where the prospect physically reacts to your additional price or like, oh my God, a thousand dollars, that's way too high. You know, find the impact the problem has on that business and the impact, personal impact it has on that person. That's more important. Sometimes don't, don't react to the knee-jerk reaction because sometimes the knee-jerk reaction from them is just to put you on your heels. Like, oh my God, it's that much. And then you go, oh, well, maybe there's something we can do. Just, yeah, it's $1,000 more. You ask for these concessions, that's going to cost that more. But if we did this, you wanted that because they did this, this, and let's talk about the problem we talked about originally. Quantify that cost of that problem and calculate the cost of delaying. Hey, you know, boy, you asked for this and this, and so that's going to drive the price up. Let's pretend we don't do anything and you do decline my offer. Help me understand what is the impact that's having on the problem you already told me about? But again, as I said before, don't drip like a wet rag every time he or she tries to twist you. Because as soon as they see that and you continue to make concessions, they'll continue to wring that rag and so, as long as they think they can get water out of it. So the knee-jerk reaction is the first one. Just don't overreact to that one. Let them get it out of their system. Find the impact that problem's having on them personally. Boy, we hear this all the time. Boy, we can get it at a lower price. Yeah, and perhaps they can. But remember, is it really a commodity? Is it, uh, find the impact, the pain, the competition can't fix. And maybe even do a preemptive move. You know, hey, it's starting over even a possibility. You know, we can get a lower price. Well, sounds like this is purely a price-driven transaction. When we started this, I didn't realize that it was purely a price-driven transaction. Maybe we should start all over again as far as what the deliverable is on my end so that I can get down to your price. Well, they don't want to start all over again. They don't want to have to re-justify. It is just a gambit that they're using to see if you'll come at a lower price. I had one happen to me today. I'm negotiating with some space uh, for new office space. Space we looked at. They told me this is available. We viewed it, 2,700 square feet, $4,200 a month, made it an offer. They came back and said, hey, you know what? We want you to take this space that's next door. I know it's another 900 square feet bigger, but we want to be able to have the possibility of renting this other space uh, with another unit right next door. So they changed the terms on me. And I said, you know, it sounds like we ought to just start all over again. And they didn't want to start like, let's look at all the other properties you have. And we'd already spent weeks looking at properties. Sounds like this isn't going to work. And then immediately they came back. Well, maybe we can get you something. <laughs> you know, it was just they were just trying to test me to see if they could get me at a higher rate, what my real budget was. And I didn't give in to it. So just understand, sometimes this is a, a, a test that they're doing. And there's nothing wrong with you saying to that, hey, is this a test? Are you just seeing if what my real budget is? And if it is, that makes sense. I understand your job is to get the best deal you can for you and your company. So I just wondered if that's it. Should we just start all over again? You know, again, when they start to bring up that your competition is cheaper, don't sweat it. Use it. Starts going back and sit there and say, hey, you know what I found is to study so that 50% of buyers back out because of price discussion. But that means that 50% of people still continue to buy the product or service, even with different prices than what was originally presented. Hey, uh, help me understand what would really happen here. Is this again, and I love that phrase, is this really come down to a price driven transaction? Because if it is, there probably isn't fit. We were never designed to be the lowest price entry level supplier of this product or service. We, we want to provide a competitive product at affordable price, but with actually good quality and great customer service. I would assume that's what you're looking for. I didn't think that you were looking for just the cheapest service. Now, they'll tell you cheap, but they really don't want the cheapest service. So don't, don't sweat it is when they bring that up. So what do you do when the buyer asks for edit value or even free value? Uh, again, they wanna feel like they won. 
some people need to feel that even in negotiating, they just need to feel that they got something. So make sure they feel that they got something of value. Hey, you know what? You're a really tough negotiator. Boy, I can't really discount at 10%, but we really can change um you know the amount down payment we don't and i i do have some flexibility there instead of five percent we can go to three percent down so at least they felt felt like they won so just make that player feel like they got something you might not have had to change your initial price or service but that person felt like a winner that's the most important thing to some of these people one of the other gambits they give you is the good guy bad guy it's not me i really want to go with you but bob's the bad guy Great. Ask to speak to Bob. Hey, can I speak to Bob? Sounds like he's the negotiator. Would it be out of the question if you and I go to him directly? And I had a debate in one of my trainings one time with some people about that. I never do an end around of the person. Never try and go over their head to the real decision maker. But always ask if you and him can or he can go together. Or can you have your bad guy at your office talk to their bad guy? <laughs> try and work it out that way if you have to. So again, think about it that way is this, are you taking on the responsibility of solving their problem or is it their challenge, is it their issue when they do something like, um, hey, um, can you, you know, our, we just had our budget cut by 30%. Whose problem is that? That's their problem, isn't it? Toss it back to them like when you're a kid, that game we played hot potato, toss it back. So are you saying I should cut the quality or the quantity by 30%? And sometimes it was just a trial balloon on their side to see what they could get if there's any other additional concessions they could get during the negotiation. Don't don't panic. Don't all radically discount 30%. But, you know, I appreciate that. That's tough. I see your budget was cut by 20, 30%. What were you hoping I would do other than cut my margin by 30%? Because that's really what they're doing. They're asking you, they want you to cut your profit by 30%. So even say to them, hey, other than cutting my profit by 30%, what do you think we should do? Sometimes you can follow, find it out that way. Um, emotional outbursts. This is where the person starts just getting, boy, you really, I've just asked you your best and final offer. Give me your best. And they start to escalate their emotional outburst on you. Don't panic. Don't fall back. Say, hey, John, love to work with you. But it's clear I've crossed the line. I've done something to really upset you. Sounds like we wouldn't be your first choice, even if price wasn't the issue. Are we past the point of no return? Just calm down. Don't panic. And that'll talk them sometimes off the ledge. Sounds like we wouldn't be your first choice, even if price wasn't an issue. Now, a lot of people, salespeople don't have the guts, discipline, or vitality to put it that way. But when you say to them, hey, I'm getting the feeling there's some other vendor that you hope comes in with a better price. There's, I'm getting a feeling there's a vendor you'd like to work with, and it's not me. Are we really past the no, point of no return? Now, what you've done is you've taken their leverage away, and you've given that to you because now you're comfortable enough with them saying, no, I'm going to go with this other person. And, and if they say that, help me understand why. What are you going to get from that person that you wouldn't have thought you'd get from me? What do you think that is it is that again, is it only the price or the other things that that person's offering? Remember the first second slide. Negotiation should be a conversation, not an interrogation. But you have a right to ask these questions instead of immediately give a concession just because they asked for it. And this one, you know, again, give me your best or final offer. You know what? If price wasn't an issue, what would you do? I'm just curious that. You know, the dumber you act, the more people want to help you. So act dumb like that. I'm just confused. If price was an issue, what, what would you do? Because if that's all you're asking, looking for is my best price, you know, help me understand back to you. What's the best price you'll pay and still be comfortable with your product or service that you bought from me? You have the right to reverse it and go back to them. I understand you're asking me for my best price, but I'm just curious what would be the most amount you'd pay and still sleep tonight well, knowing that you got a good deal? This one that happens where they give you future promises. Well, if you give me a good deal now, you might get the bigger, better deal later. Like, boy, if you if you give me a good deal on a, a gross now, boy, we're going to probably in a couple of years order thousands of these units. You know, in that situation, say, hey, I appreciate it as much as I'd like to get this deal. Unfortunately, my company won't let me do that. We have a company policy that I can only deal with the deal in front of us. 
you know, one of the things that people have used on you all the time, I'm sure, is company policy. It's our company policy. I mean, how many times have you heard that? But how many times have you used it? Hey, our company policy is I can only offer my concessions based on the deal that's in front of me, not what might be happening in the future. Does that make sense? Would that be fair? Do you understand? And it takes away their leverage. So an under, again, understanding who has the leverage here is the most important part in negotiating. So again, if they start adding that to you, then you have to decide and sit there and think about what is it that you're going to feel good about on both sides. Hey, I would feel big good if I got this deal and still made a healthy profit at 12%. And if I did that, where would you feel? How would you feel about this? Because people buy emotionally. They validate logically later. So you have a right to talk about how would they feel about this transaction? How would they feel about the communications and what we're about to do as you move forward. You know, most people feel like they're from negotiating from a point of position of weakness all the time. But let's stop and think about that for a second. And here's what I want you to do, for those of you listening on this. As you leave wherever you are today to drive home, to drive to work, whatever, as you're out there driving, do you have the belief that, boy, you're the best driver on the road and that everybody else is bad? Well, that's the kind of thought process you have to have in negotiating, that you're the best in this in this relationship. You are the best at negotiating and you have to feel that comfortable about it. And you do have the position of strength and weakness. So if you don't think that you have the power as a seller and again, you don't have it as the buyer, then when do you have the power? I need you to remember, it's not the position you're in. It's the person you are. Are, and, and too many salespeople that they fail in negotiating because they think they're in a weak position instead of thinking, hey, I'm a great negotiator. I'm going to do the best I can for my co company. I'm going to do the best I can for my customer. And one of the things I want you to understand about negotiating is it is relationship based. One of the eighth we talked about, the eight sources of leverage. Here's my definition of sales. And I repeat this to my customers. Would it be fair to say? that sales is just influencing people to a mutually beneficial decision. Sales is not about coercing, tricking, manipulating, conning somebody to buy something they don't need or want. Isn't it fair, Mr. Prospect, that sales is just influencing each other to a mutually beneficial decision? They'll typically say, yeah, that's good. I like that definition. So during this negotiation process, if we are able to come and influence each other and it's both mutually beneficial, would it make sense that we move forward? If you can do that right away, your negotiation process will be so much easier because now that person doesn't feel like you're trying to trick them or manipulate or beat them or win. And that feels like a win-win for both people in that situation because we're both trying to get out of this with a mutually beneficial decision. So that's the end of this um, training. I, I know I ran a lot of it through, but I, this we, was recorded. I'll send everybody the YouTube link so people can go back to it and pull out the, the things that they want. Um, I usually finish with this. Einstein was asked one time what his home phone number was, and he went to the phone book to look it up. Einstein said, I never keep anything up here that I can find somewhere else. So my point of that story is this. I don't expect you to retain everything that I just went over, all the bullet points. But I will give you the phone book where you can go find it and look it up later. So you'll all have that. At this point, is there anybody that either in the chat or um, wants to make a comment? Uh, you can unmute yourself if you wish. Questions by anybody? Wes, anything from your point? This is Wayne for you. Um, actually, I came in a little bit late. Yes. Uh, really great stuff there, Wayne. Um, is there a chance, uh, like you said, to get the uh, to get the Bible of where to go to get this information? Yes. Because yeah. my my YouTube channel is just Wayne W A Y N E D E H N, and um, all my videos are there at the my YouTube channel. And I'll send the link once this converts after we're done with it. And I'll send this link out. To, through the ACA site for everybody to go back and look at it. Yeah, because it, uh, I mean, you shared a ton of great stuff there. So it was awesome. I really appreciate it. Thank you.
Yeah, I have a, my, my typical negotiation program goes almost for a full day and we, we put people in different groups and we do exercises about this. You know, obviously we don't have time to do that today and that was not the intent of today's session, but I'll give you the YouTube link. But again, more importantly, if you didn't, one of the other things you have to do, everybody's watching this is you need to watch my video on the step system of selling that I've created so that you can make sure that you're following and that, because if you're really good at the following the step system of selling, you'll be good at negotiating. Yeah. And that's, that's really important because I think a lot of people get this connotation of what selling is stuck in their head and, and it's, it's a bad connotation, like a bad feeling, you know, like when, as soon as you think about selling it's, Oh my God, I got to sell somebody something versus like you said, uh, have a negotiation with someone to come to a mutually agreeable conclusion. Yeah. And I think that's powerful, man. I get a kick out of people say, oh, I, I don't want to go into sales. Yeah. We all sell. There's a, because <laughs> whether I'm influenced my wife on what I want for dinner tonight or tomorrow, what movie we want to go see, we are always influencing people, but hopefully to a mutually beneficial decision, you know, that I want to go see a romantic comedy, but she wants to go see an action movie. Well, at least we're both getting out of the house and not sitting around. So it's a mutually beneficial transaction. And as long as that's happened, then I don't think we have that negative connotation about sales that typically most people have. But unfortunately, some salespeople have ruined it for the rest of us because they do use tactics and tricks to manipulate people to buy something they don't need or want. And that's why people are fearful of salespeople, because they're afraid that they're going to be tricked into something. Well, again, it's it's just having a conversation, even in the negotiation process. It's about having a conversation up front about what a good transaction looks like for both of us. And I think I think that's really important that if you can lay that out in front of the close so that everybody's happy with what that looks like, then it's easy. There's there's no selling involved. It's just, you know, hey, let's let's uh, get your credit card and let's get started. You know, in, in my book that I'm writing, um, sell is not a four letter word, <laughs> you know? if, if, and, but that unfortunately that's the people. And I told a story last week at a chamber of commerce meeting. Um, my sister, um, her, she called me up and told me that her husband had lost his job at the auto manufacturer they worked at. And she was all nervous and worried. And I said, Oh, don't worry. I, I like Dan. I'll hire Dan. He can go to work for me. And my own sister said, Oh God, no. Dan, Dan can't be a salesman. He can't lie to people. <laughs> and I said, is, is that what you think I do? Oh, yeah, you salespeople, you're all a bunch of liars. You got the gift of gab. And I, I started thinking about saying, you know, that's what the general public has that misconception about what se selling is. 100%. When, tr when true salespeople just have conversations with people, we're really doctors. Really, a good salesperson diagnoses what's wrong with this person and offers your project as a cure what more what more noble profession could there be i mean if i go in the doctor day and my arm hurts and i go to the doctor and i tell him what the head hurts when i do this and the doctor asks me a bunch of questions says you know what i mean i just figure i think it's just a muscle strain hey let me write you out a prescription for muscle relaxers i don't say hey come on doc you got to sell me harder than that <laughs> you know he diagnosed what was wrong and offered a product as a cure well, that's what salespeople do. If you do it right, you're just asking enough questions to find out what's wrong. And then you sell them whether you think your product or service can solve their problem. That's so true. So yeah. true. But unfortunately, I think salespeople are taught incorrectly from the beginning because we, we, most people didn't go to school to learn how to sell. They just sell based on how somebody else sold them in the past. And I think that there are methodology as to how to actually sell. And so again, uh, hopefully you'll go watch some of the videos I put posted for ACA members. It's a benefit of being in the ACA is access to my uh, once a week uh, or once a month classes. And then I do other ones throughout the, um, throughout the month. So anything else before I let you guys go? No, that was really great, man. Appreciate it. All right, I will let you guys go. I will stop the recording and I'll, as soon as it converts and it's uh, posted up to YouTube, I'll let everybody know. All right, goodbye. Awesome, thank you. Thank you.